the numbers are so big in our industry that in and of themselves they become a barrier uh, between the banking sector and customers. And they explain a lot of the misunderstandings, at least from where I'm standing, uh, between what we do, who we are, and, and what people believe. I also uh, sort of recall to mind the, the Virgin, the, the Future of Better Banking Starts Here campaign, which sort of relaunched them post their takeover of Northern Rock. And that uh, campaign, that ad campaign, appeared in a 96-sheet poster at the front entrance of First Direct's headquarters in Sturton. In, um, in Leeds. Now, when I tell you that our shed in Sturton is as far away from the London Stock Exchange as the moon is from the earth, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> On a clear, hot uh, summer's day, the smell of the Arla milk factory <laughs> permeates every filter in the building. Um, but I used to smile when I drove past that poster, because I kind of thought, yeah, you just got the date wrong. It started here 25 years ago. Um, <laughs> But, but that's, when I, uh, that's when I started with First Direct, incidentally. I started, uh, in fairness, 24 years ago. I started uh, my career in financial services two weeks before First Direct launched. Um, I became a customer of the brand in 1991. Um, I joined it as, as marketing director, which was frankly just good fortune. At the tail end of 2006, I left it in 2009, um, but I came back as chief executive um, in 2000, tail end of 2011, I've been, I've been back since. I can tell you that, that it is a, an absolutely extraordinary place to spend your time, either as a customer, as a marketer, as a leader uh, of a business. It is an exceptional, extraordinary, inspiring, and, and exciting business. Um, and I treasure every single minute I spend in it. And, and whether it's a bank or not makes really no difference to me. It's, it's really important that you should know that. Um, I've got one or two things I want to share with you, one or two thoughts. Some of them derive from what I've heard today, to be fair, but I am going to try and stick to the theme of, of branding and competition, um, at least loosely. Um, okay. What it is, what it's not. Over the years, um, First Direct has been praised in its industry, in this industry, in the banking industry, uh, because we continue to lead our category pretty much when it comes to customer service and customer satisfaction. And we do it for current accounts and credit cards, and we do it for online, we do it for telephone, we do it generally at a brand level. And we don't lead our category by a little bit generally, we lead it by quite a lot. And so the gap between the industry averages and First Direct is, is a big gap. Um, but it's usually accompanied. It's usually accompanied by words such as, but you don't really make any money. There's a sort of a bitterness, there's a tail end to the, yeah, you're great, you win all these accolades and all these awards, but, but how much money do you make? Yeah, uh, and, and like many of the comments about First Direct, it's, it's kind of unencumbered by knowledge. It's a division of, of HSBC, so I'm not telling you how much money we make, but I can assure you, um, if you could buy it, you would. <laughs> it's the sort of problem that most banks would love to have. Um, but over the years, we've also been criticized, ladies and gentlemen, because we've stopped innovating. Um, and I'm minded to see merit in both perspectives. That, yeah, absolutely, we're a fabulous, fabulous brand because we've got this incredible service reputation. But we kind of don't innovate anymore. It seems like you stop doing new things, you stop doing new and exciting things. Um, but I, I will tell you that, that we have no great desire to yield uh, the service high ground in pursuit of innovation. Um, and there's been no pressing need for us to do that, if we're honest, because the competition has either never found the formula, or more likely, never possessed a genuine intent to match or exceed our service standards. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think at least, is because there has not been a correlation between customer satisfaction, customer service, and profitability in banking, unless I've been living on a different planet. How else can you explain the performance of the banking industry over the last 24, 25 years that I've been in it? Because all through that time, pretty much the industry average when it comes to customer satisfaction in retail banking has been flatlined. It hasn't gone anywhere. It has moved occasionally with the introduction, I'll talk about it in a second, with the introduction of new brands. But the big players, the main incumbents in this industry, have pretty much gotten away with a level of satisfaction which is as good as it needs to be and no better. 
And we're rational business people, are we not? So, of course, why would you beat us up if we don't spend money on things that make money? It also tells me that, it, thank goodness, we have regulators. Because if we didn't have regulators, I'm not quite sure that we would do anything about it. And I, for one, welcome the fact that they take a more strident interest in whether we're actually looking after our customers and whether we're genuine in our convictions about whether we should do better for them. Anyway, um, today, I do actually work in a better industry. I genuinely believe it. It's the best it's ever been in, in my career, in the 24 years that I've spent in it. It's better led. It is generally better managed. Um, it is certainly better regulated. It is better scrutinized by consumer groups. And it is better scrutinized by our political masters. Um, I simply don't believe it would have happened had it not been for the banking crisis. Um, I'm sure, like everyone here, it concerns me that it took a, a catastrophe to make it happen. Um, but it does tell me also that we do need to remember how we got here. Because I also work in an industry that appears to have a very short memory. Um, I am concerned by the tone, and I do mean this, um, uh, and, and the lack of measurement in how we respond to some external challenges. I am amazed at the defensiveness of our industry in response to saying we should have a cap on market share or we should have a demerger forced upon the industry. It may be that it is in fact wrong at every level, but from where I stand, we're bankers. And it's not enough for us to be right. Um, what we say will not easily be believed because the court of public opinion has kind of decided that it's not on our side for the moment. So it pays to be very, very careful about you know, how we bristle when people make criticisms of our industry. And frankly, the more we bristle, yeah, the more it looks like we doth protest too much. Whether that's true or not, actually matters less than, than the appearance. Um, the UK, you know, we heard it earlier today, the UK has, has an unusual concentration, or rather doesn't have an unusual concentration of assets when compared with other economies. Um, this is hardly surprising in my experience, given that most of us have at some level been fed on the conventional wisdom in this industry that scale and profitability are absolutely indivisible. I don't know how many presentations I've seen over the years which tell me that in banking. And it virtually, it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, it, it kind of, it speaks to a dominate or, or fail mindset. And it's not that unusual. Uh, in fairness, if you look at any uh, highly capital intensive industry, and, and one thinks of the airline industry or the car manufacturing industry, the oil exploration, it's the same thing. Yeah, you, of course you get small players because the, the amount of capital required to actually be in the industry are so, so huge that, that, that it's kind of a self-fulfilling cycle. But it's easy to see how in, in some sectors, especially in retail banking, that the, the customer can actually get lost in this industry because they are too many and they are too low value as individuals for our industry to really treat them or truly value them as individuals. Their bargaining power is non-existent. And at an individual level, therefore, you can afford to be relatively indifferent to the plight of any individual customer. Or such was the case before the advent of that troubling little phenomenon called social media, where now the consumer has a disproportionate potential power to impact the behavior of brands. And I, for one, believe that's a good thing. Not necessarily that social media is true, but that it forces us to be careful and to consider the individual before we act. I get complaints every week usually about 15, sometimes less, sometimes more. I am so mindful about what I do with each and every one of them because each and every one of them can escalate into something way, way beyond what it looks like when it's in my inbox. That's good for our industry. I also heard this morning that the category doesn't lack competition, certainly not price competition. And, and heck, that concerns me because it speaks to commoditization. Um, in the interval my colleague Chris mentioned, he reminded me of Porter's timeless warning of the dangers of being stuck in the middle. Well, the middle is where the majority are in most industries. It's certainly where the majority are in banking. Um, in the not-too-distant past, it, it talked about, it, or it signaled margin erosion, it signaled dilution of returns, it signaled risk-taking. Um, I, for one, can see it returning. Um, albeit, we have stronger capital buffers, we have stronger regulation, we are at historically low, we're in a historically low interest rate environment. 
what we think is affordable today, is that affordable when rates are at four and a half, five and a half, six and a half percent? And, and the theme of sustainability keeps on coming back to us. And sustainability is not a 50 bips interest rate environment. It really isn't. Um, uh, thank goodness we're now actually beginning to have a conversation about housing bubbles in the South. Because ultimately, we're in the business of stewarding brands for the long term. And the long term is not five years or 10 years. It is 50 years, and it is 100 years. Um, the category may not lack competition, but I genuinely believe it lacks real choice. Um, because I think that, that I could argue, and I will argue, that the actions of the major clearing banks have conspired or have resulted in a reduction of real choice, and whether it was intentional or otherwise. And that, in turn, has driven price competition. If you think about pre-demutualization, yeah, branch geographic location mattered because it was the only way that you had access to customers. So logically, banks merged and bought each other so that they spread their footprints around the UK. If you think of, if you're not, demutualization as a phenomenon, well, none of the 10 building societies that were demutualized exist as independent businesses. Some of them were snapped up relatively quickly. All of them either failed or were bought up in the end. And with it went their mortgage books and went their deposit bases. It was less about geographic coverage and was more about broadening the actual balance of the balance sheets of the banks. Um, the question, which is one that I face each and every day, and it's one that Antonio talked about this morning, is how possible is it to exist as a brand within an entity. Yeah. Have your own tone, have your own culture, have your own set of products and processes and services successfully. Yeah. To what extent does it, does it matter that you're owned by a parent as a, as a brand group? And, and how well equipped is the banking industry to actually enable that to happen? Um, if you think one step further, in the noughties, you had the introduction of a whole bunch of internet banks and internet brands. So at one level, you've got intervention by government to say, here's a whole bunch of building societies, guys. And then you have the banking industry itself saying there's a new technological opportunity. And it's called the internet. And we had Egg, and we had Smile, and we had um, Kahoot, and Intelligent Finance, and a number of others besides. None of them are in existence or marketing actively today that I can think of. Arguably, not because they in and of themselves failed, if you're really honest, but because their parents either ran out of capital or ran out of patience. Yeah. Forgetting, somewhat conveniently I might argue, that if you think about the stewardship point, the profitability of our industry, one created in the last decade, nor in the last 50 years, but in the last 200 years. And, and I think we should remind ourselves about this theme of sustainability and what you're actually in it for. But it was an interesting experiment, and now it's over. Yeah, because the internet banks are pretty much gone. It is interesting to see new banks, and it was very interesting to see what constitutes a credible new bank. Was it 5% market share it needed to have in order for it to be credible? First Direct's got about 2% market share. So clearly, it is incredible. <laughs> And, and it is an uphill, organic struggle to see how any of the, if you like, new startup brands, the fighter brands, are going to build market share today. Because it truly isn't a level playing field, um, or at least not yet. Um, I hear the voices of those who wouldn't have us compare ourselves to the apples of this world. And I worry about our unwillingness or our fear of being compared with Apple. Because Although Antonio did remind us that, that it is more likely that technology companies won't last as long as banks in the end, I don't know of that many technology companies that have been bailed out by taxpayers. It's just not a phenomenon that really transcends our industry. And I think it's really important for us to remember that. Because what we want is clearly to avoid the uh, recurrence of that into the future. Um, last night, I, I read a, a quote, which I'll, I'll read back to you. Um, because I don't think it's enough for us to do things differently. First Direct was a paradigm-shifting brand. Most brands don't get to do that at all. And it paradigm-shifted by opening up the service window and extending it into seven days and 24-7, 365. 
And anything we've done subsequent to doing that, we've been, if you like, criticized on the back of it not being innovative enough. Innovative enough. Apple's a paradigm-shifting brand, folks. It's just shifted the paradigm more than once. That is its genius. And every time it's shifted the paradigm more than once, it's exponentially grown the scale of its business. I'm a Macalite. I've been a Macalite, a victim, a fashion fatality for the last 25 years. I begrudge the scale of Apple because I liked it when it was small. And only I liked it and only I really knew about it or pointy heads like me. And there is a challenge that comes with success and with growth. How brands that once felt special, once felt special, can dilute that specialness through their own success. It's a challenge I'd like to have, if I'm honest with you, at First Direct. <laughs> We've got 1.25 million customers. We probably can see our way to having three over the next three to five years. But I would be horribly hesitant about telling you that I saw a future where, where we had five or six. The challenge for us is to know what we're good at, to be prepared to leave money on the table to protect what we're good at, which is not something that many bankers are want to do, or not many industries, in fairness, are want to do. And, and I say that in light of, of, of something that Bill Gates said 20 years ago, which is that banking is needed uh, banks are not. Um, and let me finish with a word about brands. Um, what is a brand if it's not a set of words or a symbol imbued with meaning? I spent years of my career in marketing. I've not given up on it just yet. Um, this meaning is founded or derived from the history, the actions, the processes, the policies, and the very culture of the businesses they symbolize. Brands develop reputations no more nor less than yours or mine. The reputation is created, improved, damaged, or confirmed at every moment of truth. The reputation is a living thing, a fragile thing, a real thing. And in the end, while we figure out at First Direct uh, what different things to do, and I really believe we have to, we'll continue to do things differently because you simply can't fake it. Thank you. <laughs>